Hello, welcome back to the studio. Today's video is going to be a little bit different because I'll be using some very old footage. The, the video that you're about to see was actually recorded about eight months ago. This was originally recorded for another series that I was planning that didn't quite pan out, but I thought that this video would fit in quite well with some of the content that I'm producing now, so I've decided to release it. Today's video will be broken up into two basic sections. In the first part of this video, I will be um, trying out and reviewing some Roman Schmal Aquarius watercolor paints. In the second section of this video, I will be using these same paints to select a limited palette for use in a finished botanical art piece. If you're new here, welcome! My name is Lee. I'm a botanical and natural science illustrator based in Kitchener, Waterloo, Canada. On this channel, I share watercolor techniques and tips and some insights into my daily life as an illustrator. If this is content that you're interested in, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. So in the first section of this video, I will be reviewing some Roman Schmal Aquarius watercolor paints. Roman Schmal Aquarius is a fairly new brand. They're based in Poland. Um, and the, this is a small watercolor company, but they have a very large selection of watercolor paints. If you've been following my channel from the beginning, you'll know that I have already reviewed Roman Schmal Aquarius once. I'll link that video up above. My first review was based on some paints that were sent to me direct by Roman Schmal. Um, so I didn't buy those paints and I didn't select most of the colors. I was sent a selection of colors that uh, were chosen to represent some of the more unique pigments as well as uh, some of the interesting mixes that are available in the Roman Schmal Aquarius line. However, while these colors were very unique, they weren't necessarily the most practical selection of colors for painting botanical art pieces. However, I could really tell that the paint behavior was really nice. I like how they spread on the page and what vivid, rich colors are available in this line. So I decided to purchase some myself. The colors that I'm reviewing today are all colors that I bought with my own money, so you can be extra sure that this is an unbiased review. I'm not being paid by the company to share these opinions. These are 100% just my own impressions of this paint. And so actually on the topic of unbiased, I'm going to get the one negative thing out of the way right off the top. Um, the only negative experience I've had with any of these paints or any of these pans is with this first color, Bismuth Yellow. Um, and it's not the paint. The paint is great. I've actually been using this pan a lot in my recent paintings. However, when I unwrapped the pan, it had a thick layer of grime right on the top layer of the pan. It's as though the pan had been filled and then tipped over and like fallen on the floor and has all this grit right at the top of it. Um, so that's really unfortunate and not something that I like to see on my watercolor paints, but you'll see once I swatch it that it's actually a really gorgeous bright yellow. Um, I don't use lemon yellow as much. I mostly focus on the next paint that you'll see, PY150 Nickel Azo Yellow. But when I do need a true lemon yellow, and sometimes for underpainting, bismuth yellow has become my go-to, and Roman Schmal Aquarius, despite the unfortunate uh, experience with the top of this pan, has very quickly turned into one of my favorite brands for this pigment. Next you'll see me fast forward through unwrapping all of the other pans and there were absolutely no other problems with any kind of grit or dirt on any of the other pans. I actually checked very carefully to make sure, but all the other pans were really beautifully wrapped. And as always, I'd like to point out 
Um, Roman Schmall Aquarius has these lovely hand-painted labels for each of their individual pans, which really gives you a much better idea of what the paint is going to look like than any kind of printed label that you might ever find. So I really appreciate that personal touch. Next you see me quickly fill in some information and some um, opacity lines on this color swatch sheet. This color swatch sheet is from Sadie Saves the Day. Um, I'll link to Shada's uh, website where you can download this as well as her YouTube channel. And then I'm going to start swatching. So very first is that first bismuth yellow. And as you can see, this is a lovely clear yellow, um, very bright and punchy and uh, very much on the lemon side. Next is my all-time favorite nickel azo yellow. And I have to say that Roman Schmal makes an absolutely gorgeous version. It's a little bit on the warmer side than um, the M. Graham version that I usually use, but it's still very beautiful and I really like how um, the shading works, how it's it's very nice even in mass tone. Next I swatched Azo Red PR144. This is a perline pigment. It's a, a nice punchy uh, red apple red. Really love it. Nice and transparent. Next I swatched PR122 Magenta. This is another one of my personal favorite pigments that I include in every palette. And once again, the Roman Schmal Aquarius version is really lovely, very, very saturated and punchy. It does show a little bit of texture, uh, which, you know, this quinacridones are very tiny particles. So uh, sometimes that's a sign that it hasn't been mulled as finely. Um, but it's still very, very gorgeous. I really like this version of the paint. Next, we've got uh, Thalo Blue Green Shade, uh, PB15-3. Again, a really wonderful version. Um, I really like these Thalo Blues that are a little bit more on the greener side. This is a really gorgeous version. Thalo Turquoise PB16 is a very similar pigment and one of my personal favorites. And once again, Roman Schmal Aquarius makes one of my favorite versions. Next we have Ocean Blue, which is a unique mix of that PB15-3 Thalo Blue Green Shade mixed with PBR24, which is a Naples Yellow pigment. It applies, when, when you apply it, it looks like a phthalo turquoise, but then it separates into its two components, so it looks like an ocean with sand in it. It's a really unique mix and really gorgeous. It's subtle, but a really interesting effects paint. I really love it uh, and would strongly recommend it, especially if you like granulating separating paints. Next we have Cobalt Teal. I was very excited about this paint because it's made with PG50, which is my favorite pigment for this sort of shade. Um, uh, cobalt teals are sometimes also made with PB36 or PB28, but I tend to prefer the PG50s. I will say that this is not my very favorite version of a cobalt teal. It is a bit of a lighter shade. It, uh, looks closer to a cerulean a little bit. Um, so it's not my personal favorite, but it is still a very nice version. Next we have PBK31 Perylene Green. This is again a personal favorite pigment that I include in every palette. I was very excited to try this version from Roman Schmal and it absolutely did not disappoint. This is perhaps the most saturated and vibrant perylene green that I've ever seen. So it's still very dark like all perylene greens, but it has much more of a green character that remains. Likewise, the perylene violet, the PV29, is also perylene pigments in general. They do tend to mute very much as they dry, and the perylene violet from Roman Schmal Aquarius does retain some of that bright, uh, purpley tone that it has when it's wet. It still has a little bit of that when it's dry, which is really unique and wonderful. 
Next we have uh, PO48, or sorry, nope. Next we have PY43 Transparent Gold Ochre. This is uh, a, an earth tone that I wanted to try because I like things like quinacridone gold and uh, non-transparent gold ochres. Again, this is not, it turns out, my favorite shade, but this is not really a criticism of the paint. The paint is lovely. It's just not a color that I will reach for very frequently. Next we have PO48 Quinacridone Burnt Sienna. This is known as Quinacridone Burnt Orange or um, Quinacridone Rust from other brands that offer it. And this is a very nice version. It's a little bit more brown than some of the other versions. Uh, a little bit more like a traditional Burnt Sienna. But very nice. I do very much like it. Finally, the last pigment on this list is PBR23 Transparent Brown. And I think that Roman Schmal might be the only brand that offers this pigment. And again, this is super lovely. I really, really love this paint. I've included it in one of my palettes recently. Um, I haven't had a chance to use it very much, but it is absolutely stunning and gorgeous. So overall, I'm super happy with all of these paints. I'm really excited to use them and include them in my palettes. And also, I'm really glad that I bought all of these paints for myself. Um, I feel like they really add and complement the paints that I received previously. And together, I feel like I could really build a really practical palette with these paints. Um, I don't tend to be brand loyal in any way, so I'll probably just mix them up with other paints and other palettes. Uh, but I will say that Roman Schmal is one of the few brands that makes enough paints with the behaviors that I want that I could conceivably work out of a palette of only Roman Schmal paints. And uh, if you know me, that is high praise. If you've been watching my last couple of videos, you'll know that I'm partway through a botanical art process series where I go from start to finish all of the different steps that I take to create a finished botanical art painting. Using as an example, a painting of Liatris or Blazing Star, a native Canadian wildflower that I'm currently working on. I'll have the next video in that series sometime in the next couple of weeks. Um, as you may be beginning to see, uh, creating botanical art pieces is kind of a long and involved process, so uh, I'll have that up as soon as I'm able. However, I was really interested in some of the feedback that I got from the last video in that series. A couple of people, both on YouTube and off, asked me uh, to give a little bit more in-depth uh, view as to some of the specific thought process that I put into choosing specific paints for one piece. Um, why I would choose, for example, one uh, fallow green versus another. Um, and I think that's fascinating, and I agree that I didn't really do the best job at communicating that in my Liatris painting in the selection of colors for that. But what you don't know, <laughs> or didn't until right now, is that this is actually the second time that I'm creating this botanical art process series. The first time I tried to create it, I was going to do a different painting. I was going to make a painting of Romanesco cauliflower. Um, and that's what this upcoming footage is, is choosing the colors for a Romanesco cauliflower painting. Unfortunately, or really fortunately, depending on how you want to think about it, I got a commission request right around the same time and I had to set aside my Romanesco painting. Um, I will probably eventually revisit it, but at this point I would probably use some colors in my studio palettes. I'll leave a link up above to my live streams where I filled and swatched the studio palettes that I just upgraded to. So the specific choice of paints that you're going to see here 
probably will never actually be used in this way. However, I did a really good job, I think, when I created this video of explaining some of the thought process and some of the, the different competing thoughts that go into my head when I'm choosing colors for a specific piece. My first step when I'm designing a limited color palette to use in a piece is to really spend some time staring at my subject, turning it around and really thinking about the colors that I see and what I want to communicate through this piece. In the case of the Romanesco cauliflower, I found two very striking things about this subject. The first is the geometric fractal pattern of the cauliflower itself. This pattern is so unique that I actually considered creating this piece in black and white, but of course that wouldn't make for a very interesting video in this case. In the end, I decided to also incorporate the very, very bright green. I don't think that my screen really does it justice, but this is one of the brightest, springiest greens you can imagine. I figured if I was going to paint this in color, I should really embrace this color and go as bright as I possibly could. And for that, I will need a bright lemon yellow to mix those bright, punchy greens. Only after thinking of the colors of the subject and how I want to communicate them do I get out a paper and some paint and start thinking about which paints to use. I keep a bucket of paper scraps in my studio. These are trimmings from pieces when I cut them down to frameable size. They're also when I've made sketchbooks and such, I always keep the extra little bits of paper. They're very useful for quickly testing out colors and mixes like this. The first ingredient I need for mixing very bright neonish greens like this Romanesco is a very bright lemon yellow. Lemon yellows are a bit challenging. I usually prefer to use Nickel Azo Yellow PY150 for all of my mixes, but it doesn't mix quite as vibrant neon greens as I would like in this case. So I'm instead reaching for this PY184 Bismuth Yellow that I just got from Roman Schmal Aquarius. I couldn't resist testing out the Nicolazzo just in case, but at first glance I could already tell that that's just not going to work. In order to bring out the brightest areas, the most neon areas of this Romanesco cauliflower, I also do want to include some areas that aren't quite as punchy. And for that, I do want another yellowish color. While the Nicolazzo yellow was a little too warm and punchy for these areas, I thought one of Roman Schmal's green gold options might be good. I have two. The first one is a traditional green gold made with PY129. The second is a slightly greener version made with three pigments, the traditional PY29 and the addition of PG36 and my beloved PY150. At first glance, I think either of these could work, so I'll try them out in some mixes in a moment. Next, I'll need something to mix this Bismuth Yellow with to make those bright, bright greens. My first impulse for mixing these neon greens would actually be to start with a phthalo green, like a PG7 or a PG36. But as I already had two of the Roman Schmal paints, I wondered whether I might be able to make a palette using only the Roman Schmal paints for this piece. Since the bright green is going to be so close to the bismuth yellow, I'm only going to use a drop of anything else. I think this will be okay. I have two options. I can use PB16 Thalo Turquoise, which is a little bit greener, but it is a little bit more muted. Or I can use the slightly brighter, but slightly bluer, Thalo Blue Green shade. I'm going to swatch them both and then try them both in mixes. As soon as I start playing with both of these paints and mixes, it becomes clear to me that what I really want is the Thalo Blue Green shade, the PB15-3. These mixes seem a little bit cleaner to me. Now that I've chosen my blue tone, I'm going to try experimenting with both of my green gold options to see which one works better. 
I think that the slightly brighter, more lively mixes with the three pigment mixed green gold look a little bit nicer. And this is a way to sneak in my beloved PY150 Nicolazo Yellow. Next, I need to start thinking about how I'm going to create shadows and contrast in this painting. If I only used these bright yellow and green and blue colors, I wouldn't have a complete painting. So my first thought was to go to a CMY triad since I already had a bright yellow and a bright cyanish blue and tried a PR122 quinacridone magenta. I mixed it with a few of the colors, but pretty quickly realized that this was going to be really hard to balance. If I wanted to create my shadows with quinacridone magenta, I would always have to be mixing three different colors to get any kind of a shadow tone, and it would be difficult to always get it in the right color temperature. So instead, I'm reaching for the much darker and more muted Perlene Violet PV29, which is also a reddish violet in a similar color family to the magenta, but it won't ever be overwhelming because it's so dark and muted. Perlene Violet also has the advantage of pairing very well with Perlene Green. These two colors together mix a very dark near black. In the deepest shadow tones, I'll be using this mix of Perlene Violet and Perlene Green to create the deepest shadows before glazing over with my lighter, brighter greens. I also know that I will use both of these colors in different areas of the painting. Perlene Violet can be mixed with the yellows in my palette, that green gold and the bismuth yellow, to create some brown tones for those little crusty bits right on the tips. And in smaller quantities, in the blanched areas that don't have chlorophyll and therefore appear a creamier yellow. The perylene green, on the other hand, can be mixed directly with the yellows to create its own variety of bright greens. They're just very slightly different from the greens created by mixing with the phthalo blue. So now I've decided which five paints I will be using to create this painting. They are a bismuth yellow made with PY184, a green gold sort of hue made with a mix of three different pigments, a phthalo blue green shade made with PB153, a perylene violet PB29, and a perylene green PBK31. All of these paints are made by Roman Schmal. I hope you enjoyed this insight into my process for choosing colors. How do you choose colors for a piece? Let me know down in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed that little look into my thought process and how my brain works. Uh, let me know down in the comments below how you choose colors when you're working on your own pieces. Also, as always, if you enjoyed this content, don't forget to hit like and subscribe and ring the bell if you'd like to be notified when my next video comes out. Thanks again. Bye-bye.